just let me know if it's going to be only English. Okay. So just let me know if it's going to be only English or you want Hindi as well. So uh, that would yes, help me just to switch. Yes. This is uh, the English medium phase. So we will keep it in English only. Okay. Uh, Tamil Nadu is also there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Only English. Fine, fine. All right. So uh, before we begin with this session, and I will start sharing my slides and all, but I would want to know first that what is your idea of instruction design? And like everyone has been teaching, right? And teaching for a number of years. So why do we need to do instruction design session? So your ideas, please. You can type if anyone wants to actually speak up, then maybe Diksha can give them the access to mic. Yeah. So what's your idea of instruction design and basically why do you need instruction design if you have been teaching for quite a bit of time? Okay, for an organized information to bring perfection in action. Okay, for teaching learning process. Yeah, but for teaching learning process, we do have like, we have learned it in BEAD, right? Like we have the lesson plans and the session plans and perfection in teaching. Okay, there are two, three people who are saying perfection in teaching. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one thing about the perfection in teaching okay are we perfect can students be perfect can we have a perfect teaching learning uh, scenario which goes exactly as planned uh, now yes. there's one very good answer that is productiveness of the teaching yeah but what about being perfect make teaching joyful okay first of all teacher must be perfect then after teaching perfect okay yes i feel perfection after okay we'll we'll try to bring in perfection it's a planning for teaching okay so if, a, if it is a planning for teaching then how is it different from the lesson plans and different strategies that we have been doing measurable outcomes yes now here it's something that is actually uh perfect this is how we uh for better implementation Contextual activity. Now, this is what we need. So, fine. Now, I'll start sharing my screen and just uh, let me know if the screen is visible. Once the screen share starts, I hope the screen is visible now for everyone. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Can you make it slideshow so that it's. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I was just making that itself. Yeah. Okay. So here is to the instructional design. Now, why do we need instructional design if each one of us has been teaching so much, right? So uh, to assume that we do not know what is instruction design would be foolish on my part. In fact, you would be knowing a lot of things that could be a great value addition here. So what is instruction design and what are we going to do in this particular session? So in this session, what we are going to do is uh, what you all just said. I have just tried to put it into a very proper, discreet way. And of course, as we go ahead, uh, my slides will have certain slides which would be, I mean, I'm okay and it, you can take screenshots of them. So like how we have in at monumental places, how we have uh, selfie points, uh, you will have screenshot slides. So feel free to take the screenshots whenever required. All right. So the first thing that someone said was to have contextual activities and to have learning outcomes. So instructional design uses basically a little bit of backward design as well, in addition to what we can call as forward thinking, where we anticipate what things would come up. And therefore, it provides a very, very clear guidance, which in other words, is going to help people to learn themselves and to develop their competencies. So when we say that it's using backward design and also forward thinking process means we are talking about the design of the entire teaching learning process, which essentially is very, very contextual. But more or less, it is, it can be templatized. The process can be templatized, but it needs to have enough of flexibility to add all contextual activities as much as possible. Now, what works in my class might not work in your class. And what works in your class might not work in my class. 
But at the same time, I would know that, okay, if this is the subject, I can do all these things and I need to like carefully pick and choose whatever is suitable to my context. So therefore, it's not a description oriented. Unlike teaching plans, which are more description oriented, where we will do this, we will do that. The, here, the focus in instruction design is completely on the outcomes that are expected. So for that particular part, for that uh, outcome to be achieved, what would be the method, what would be the strategy in my specific situation that I will apply is in short, the plan of instruction design. And therefore, it is, and it is a design. So if it is designed, that means we should be able to make and break uh, different components in such a way that they can be rearranged to form a different design. Like, okay, so we are heading towards the um, festival season. So I will just give you one example of this. Um, there are Rangoli patterns made all over India. Now, each component is different and I can make hundreds of designs out of it. If I want to make it using a particular rice paste, I can use that. If I want to use flowers, I can use that. I want to use paper, I can use that. The designed elements are broken down, right? So same way in the instruction design as well, uh, things are broken down into minute components. And these components will be then mixed and repurposed and reused into our own specific situations. Most important. That's the reason why I was asking you that, can we be perfect? Can we be perfect? Ideally speaking, we cannot be perfect. Okay, perfectionism is, is illusive. You, you can aspire to be perfect. You can try to be perfect. You can give your whole and soul to be perfect. But still, there will be some part missing. Uh, therefore, we say that this is probabilistic. So if I'm going to use a particular design, if I'm going to use a particular thing, it is probably going to... And uh, there's a disturbance. Someone's mic is open, I guess. Uh, you all are able to hear me, right? Yes. You can just put a thumbs up or something like that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, that was very quick. Yeah. So probabilistic means it is, uh, I will try to design the best possible instruction design for my subject, for my class. And I, it's not hope. Remember, I'm not saying that I hope that it will work. No, I have designed it in such a way that probably the probability or I would just be more specific and scientific in saying this, that the way I have designed ensures that the probability of this design working well in my situation is very high. Now, uh, this is just as a quick brush up that probability can either be between any value between zero and one. You cannot exceed one. One means perfect, full. So even if I get to point nine as my probability, I would say that yes, this is fine. And then I just need to tweak a little bit so that I can reach to 0.99 and I still understand that still something might be, you know, uh, left to achieve. And therefore, this is what comes in picture. And if I have given you the clear picture of the Rangoli thing, I will make the things. I'll just uh, try to put it for design. I'll see the color combination. I'll feel that, oh, yeah, this is good enough but I need to add something or I need to remove something. I should be able to do that without disturbing whatever I have made. That's the logic of instruction design. If this is good enough, um, I want some uh, sign or some indication from you that we can go ahead. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask questions anytime because that's what we are going to do in the session. It's a safe place. Don't worry. No question is uh, something that you feel ordered to ask. Nothing like that. So if if everyone is okay with going ahead, just... Uh, okay, there are... My God, 99 messages in the chat. Okay, continue. Yeah, fine. Okay, great. 
Now, I was just wondering whether the Rangoli design is applicable to the states that are present here, but I think everyone could uh, relate, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that nod. Okay. So, uh, I might not be able to pronounce your names correctly, so please forgive me for that, but uh, Henmin Lal Ji is like very quick to say yes, <laughs> and uh, or even the thumbs up, so that's very nice. Okay, let's go ahead. Now, coming from a science background, uh, I can't help but to bring in science components. So, like human bodies are made up of DNA, which are the building blocks. So, even instruction design also has got certain building blocks. Now, these building blocks are nothing but the models on which we can build up our instruction or based on... Uh, based on this particular model we can design our components which can then be suitably you know juxtaposed properly so what is this particular model talking of or uh, how do we understand this so what do we do first and i want everyone to relate it with the common teaching practices that we have been doing in class so while teaching so that it becomes like oh okay this and this is similar but this and this is different here in this particular aspect. So this is nothing new. This is not rocket science. It's quite relatable. But there are finer points which are different. And that's why uh, I just said that please focus when uh, try to relate what it's saying. So the first thing that we do is to analyze. Now, what do we actually analyze? Uh, Lucy, yes, your hand is raised. Go on. I don't know if you can be unmuted. Diksha, can we unmute Lucy, please? Um, do you have any queries? Yeah, I think she has raised her hand. Lucy? Uh, maybe it's raised by mistake. Oh, okay. Is it by mistake? All right. All right. So now what do we mean by needs and constraints? So we are going to analyze the needs and the constraints of whom? Of our learners. Okay, now what would be the needs? Now, every time that we do our teaching learning process in the uh, lesson plans, in the teaching plans, we have been doing this right since our beard days that we identify what is the need. And in beard, we call it as need analysis. If you can remember this particular part that what do my students need to learn? What do my students have as their previous knowledge? What is the background of that? So all of it is there. But then what are the constraints? Let's just take a moment. What would be the constraints? And if you can think of a few constraints, uh, just put it up in the chat. Constraints can be multiple, but they are not related to uh, the previous background. Okay, if you if you think that uh, I'm going to teach, let us say, quadratic equations in mathematics, but my students don't know how to do squares or multiplication, well, that's not actually a constraint. So what is a constraint then? Yeah, I can see oh, 17 uh, group that we address. Language barriers, learning environment. No, previous knowledge is not actually the uh, constraint. Oh, wow. Uh, Prakash Raoji has given an entire list Physical constraints, technological constraints, budget constraints, lovely. Temporal constraints and administrative constraints, lovely, lovely. So, and he's like spot on. And I'm just going through the others. Accessibility, limits, context analysis, limited duration for learning, budget, physical and logistical limitations. Okay. So now, if you see the comments, okay, it's very interesting to see that two words have been used very distinctively. One is constraint and one is limitation. Then what's the difference? And they are not same, right? So, what is it? Okay. 
even before my question finishes, the answers are there. So that's lovely. Emotional constraints. Uh, could you just explain a little bit about that? Syllabus is also one of the constraints. Uh, no, not really, because syllabus is something on the basis of which we are going to build our instruction. Ambiguity is in a topic. That's why we are there. And that is why instruction design is there. Uh, uh, okay. Anxiety and stress. That's not a constraint. Uh, okay, I can see a big comment coming. Fundamental characteristics cannot be changed are the limitations and constraints. That means you can overcome those constraints. Is it? Okay. But the best part, what uh, he explained earlier was constraints are of five types. So if my class size, okay, my class size is like 120, the state from the city from where I come from, 120 is a very common and a very standard classroom size, 120 students. Yeah, it's it's very common. So uh, now is it a limit? Is it a limitation or is it a constraint? Yeah, I cannot apply what you guys can apply in a 40 uh, strength classroom, right? Because whichever group activity will work for a strength of 40, it's impossible for me to put in 120. Okay, there are 15, uh, 16 now. Large classroom is a constraint. Yes, it is a constraint. Yeah, it's not my limitation. It is a constraint. Now, that means that I, a constraint means I have to think within that particular thing. If possible, yeah, it can be changed, but then it will lead to a lot of different things. Like, uh, I can't change the, the classroom strength. I can't say that, okay, no, no, I can't teach 120 students. I need a smaller class. That's not going to be possible. My constraint is that the sitting arrangement is such a, in such a way that we have benches, and I cannot conduct an activity. That's my constraint. So I can overcome the constraint either by shifting my class to, let us say, a um, conference room or by designing the activity in such a way where the group activity can be done by people sitting next to each other in one particular bench. And then I will have to have that many activities. So my first step will always begin with my analysis. So this analysis is going to be dictated by not just the needs, but also by the constraints. And like rightly he had said earlier, there would be technological parts as well. So now just see, like I do teacher training a lot. Now I teach, uh, I mean, I suggest the teachers to use smart board and have activities like think, pair, share, where students can come up and actually use the smart board. Yeah, but that's all true for a class strength of, let's say, 40 or 45. For 120, if I'm going to allow even 10 groups to come up, my time is just going to go off. So what do I need then? So I come from a city which is having full-fledged Wi-Fi. So then can I use, instead of, you know, asking them to come up on the days, can I make use of smarter tools which can be used on mobile phones and we do allow use of mobile phones in the class so if that is my uh, I would say it's an answer to my constraint so I would allow them to use my their own mobile phones we use uh, bring your own device to a large extent so this would be my particular analysis of what is needed and what are my constraints. It would be very different for you all. And therefore, it cannot be replicated. One particular instructional design lesson plan cannot be replicated to the next class. So that's the first thing that we do, analyze. Then we start designing the outcome-based activities. Now, this is the most crucial step. Now, I'll just give you one example and then we will want to discuss other different examples. Like suppose now, 
I were to take, uh, I'm giving you this particular ex as a real example that we have done. So in a particular school uh, for ninth grade, we designed an activity where we were going to do the follow-up of or tracking of germination, the process of germination. Now, um, as normal, the teacher was thinking that, okay, uh, we will ask them to sow the gram, that is moong, and we will get it. Now, I asked the teacher that, okay, class strength is around, say, 75. So I said, okay, 70. So even if it is a group activity, and let's have even 10 students or 7 students in a group, you're going to have 10 groups bringing up with moong, and you're going to germinate that particular thing. What sense does it make if everyone is going to do the same thing? Let's do something else. What we can do is uh, we can ask them to bring different pulses, different legumes. So we had different legumes, different groups bringing in different legumes. So one is bringing moong, the other is bringing lobia, the third one is bringing, you know, whatever locally, uh, whatever is available at home. And then develop a journal where they will be actually tracking how much time does this type of legume take, the other legume, how much does it take. And they were supposed to click photographs because, like I said, we allow the use of mobile phones. So they're supposed to click a photograph every single day. Uh, so we also have this kind of thing called as one minute every day. So one minute every day is where we decide that one particular group uh, takes the photo at let us say 7 a.m. because yeah, our schools begin at 7, 6.50 actually. So 7 a.m. Uh, you click the photo. So every single day you will click the photo at 7 a.m. The other group clicks the photo at 8 a.m. The next one at 9 and so on. So that group is actually, you know, tracking the growth of that process for exact 24 hours. And is there any difference? So this was the thing that was designed. So we know what is the outcome. But what is the constraint? I cannot ask them to come and keep on explaining it to the class. So what is my solution? In the design, my solution has to come. So, okay, we will have an exhibition. Or we will ask them to submit online. Now, exhibition, that means, again, I need to take administrative constraints. Like it was written five types of constraints, right? So then I need to fix up things and then put up exhibition. Yeah, quite possible. So let us do it on the day when, you know, the monthly meeting is there and when parents also come in. So let them have a look at what their kids have done. So that was one particular thing. Also, what we thought was technological constraints we don't have. So let us create a Padlet kind of a thing where students are actually putting up a digital exhibition. And so the design is always in such a way that for the parents who cannot come, because someone had initially mentioned that instruction design helps in access. So what about those parents who are working and they who cannot come for the monthly meeting? So they shouldn't miss out on what their children are doing. So, okay, let's have an online part as well. So there's an exhibition which is physical. There's an exhibition which is uh, on the net. And so the outcome is very sure. What is the outcome? The outcome is that Every single day of the entire process, students are going to map, observe, write. Instead of drawing, we allowed photographs, but we had also allowed students to sketch and create an entire journal of the process of germination. So that is the design. And then when we thought about all the things that are possible, so, you know, should we use a scrapbook or should we use something else? So that's my production part. Now, this particular thing also works when we are doing e-resources, when we are developing e-resources. Like, for example, if we'll say just now, okay? So yesterday when Nidhi had called me up and said that, okay, tomorrow you have a session. I told her, yes, I know that today I have a session. But also please note that I'm going to travel. So over the night, I have traveled from Pune to Ajmer. So my constraint is that, okay, so I might not be exactly able to join at 9.30. There might be something which might not work. I don't know, right? So that is my constraint. So how do I design my activity then under those circumstances? All right, I need to do this, this, this kind of a thing. This should be available as an extra. So I need to carry this. I need to carry that. 
and if I'm going to produce something, so here luckily there's a studio, so I could have also said that okay, I want to have this as live, live telecast. If she would have said they were ready with that live telecast thing, so it could have been like you know the the production part also plays the important role on and the production always will be based on your first two steps analyze and design if my analysis of my need and my constraint is not clear then there will be a problem in the design if you recollect i asked you whether you want it in english and hindi as well okay so that's the quick thing that i'm doing that okay if this is the need that it has to be only English. The previous one, the previous session that we conducted, they wanted it in Hindi also. So most of the time I was speaking in Hindi. So that was the need of that particular group. So my outcome-based activity would be changing. My design would change. The thing that I said about Rangoli that was also not used in the last session because that was not how I started the session. So my production always will change keeping in mind what I am analyzing, what my analysis tells me and what outcome I desire. Now, just take a moment before we go to the next two steps. What if the same activity, the germination wala activity, if I were to, or rather you were to conduct this particular activity, but the students do not use mobile phones in your class, and your class strength is only 40, then your analysis of your need and constraint has changed, right? So would the outcome be different? Would you be using an exhibition otherwise? Or what would it be? So you can chat. Or if you want to unmute, then you'll have to ask. Yeah. What would be the change in the outcome? What would be the change in the outcome-based activity at that time? Okay, so we got lots of answers here again. Classroom activity, can ask them to draw everyday progress, yes. And then would you ask them to share? No need of exhibition, but groups may present their observation. Yes, it would be just talk about it to the whole class. Yes, yes, we are going to suggest some designs for remote areas as well, but for that we do need to have. They can write an assignment. Okay, now here comes the thing. Uh, when we talk about outcome-based activities, and if you talk about NEP 2020, which I'm sure you must have undergone a lot of rigorous training also, we have to think of very different kind of activities. We cannot just think of write an assignment because NEP very strongly um, proposes that we should use different types of assessment and we should not focus only on the written part. So it's we have to think beyond. Now, for that particular thing, that uh, what about the remote places? Okay, so again, a real life example. Uh, there is a tribal area where near Mumbai it is. Yeah, people do find it difficult to believe, but yeah, there are tribal. Uh, areas very close by and they are like uh, you will not believe that it is so close to the mega metro city okay so what happens there is uh, when we go there I'm associated with certain groups so uh, we do teaching learning and teacher training there as well we do not use any of the technology part because they might not know but we upgrade them so that's that's both of the things will go hand in hand and you will be surprised to know that there are Zilla Parishad government schools there which completely function on tabs. Okay, they were in fact the first uh, schools who developed tab-based education and it's called, there is also a model based on that. It's called as the Pashta part of model. So that's a different thing. But yeah, we do use uh, technology there. But what we also do is... Uh, even if for the same germination type of thing. We would also do this with respect to the different plants that are there. And I just remember teaching, uh, I mean, training the teachers for this particular type of thing where we are teaching Newton's law. Now, Newton's law to explain like Newton's third law rocket, it's completely non-relatable. 
So you cannot even explain the gymnasium wala things. But they use the bow and arrow, the small ones that are made from the cane. So we pick up examples from there to explain. And then like um, if it's a teacher trainer like me, I would tell the teachers, please don't explain first. So it kills the curiosity of the kids. Let them actually try to do this. And then, you know, note down their observations and conclude and then introduce the topic whatever is there in the textbook right like what will happen if I just pull it only this much till where will that uh, dart go and then again here so dart game type of a thing and then how what is this difference about the pressure and the distance and all that and then comes is there any law for this that you have concluded from your observations yes so what is that law then it's newton's law so that way we can do and i'm sure we do this in beard right we do this as the induction and the set induction the relations there are lots of comments let me take a moment to see the comments that are there okay each group should be led by high iq student oh okay uh I would not recommend that basically because of multiple reasons. High IQ student. Uh, first of all, okay, we should not, I mean, I'm a very strong proponent of this that we should not classify students like this because that leads to uh, high discrimination. It also leads to the superiority complex amongst that one or two students and also inferiority complex amongst others. Every student has got a very good IQ in something or the other. So as teachers, we need to understand this, that no, we cannot and we should not uh, classify students like that. So let's first get this straight that, uh, I mean, if you think back and if you look back when you were in school, at least I have had this experience. When I was a school student, my friends, my classmates who never scored well, but probably they are doing very well today in life. So it does not mean that everything depends upon the scores that you scored there in, in your exam. And it's not only dependent on the IQ. So I would not recommend that particular part at all. Now, when you start putting uh, things to action, when you start implementing things, uh, like I said in the beginning, instruction design gives us components, very small, minor components here, which we can tweak. And it's it gives us a flexible thing as well. It, so the components, the structure, the skeleton is same, but we can have a flexibility within it. So like someone said that we'll ask them to sketch every single day the progress. Yes, sketching can be there. Uh, I can also ask students to make a comic strip. If I find that my students are very interested in creative pursuits, I can ask them to do that. I can, uh, if my students are very, um, like the language that today's students speak is of memes and cartoons. Can I ask them to create memes? Can I ask them to create dialogues? So, you know, um, I actually have seen this. So there was a student who drew the entire process of germination using a comic strip where the root actually nudges you know, the small stones or the small mud stones, I would say. I don't know what to call it. Lumps of stones, uh, lumps of mud. And the root actually is like nudging and saying, hey, break, yeah, I want to grow. So that's how, you know, uh, the root tries to uh, break the lumps of the sand. So even that can come up. So we can just see this. I can see Nagendra uh, sir nicely smiling at that particular thing. <laughs> Good. So even we were very happy to see that type of a comic strip. So when we put things to implement, uh, even if we had if we had given them that sketch, that okay, you can go ahead and sketch. But we did not, we were not very particular about it. And the student said that, can we draw a comic strip? I said, ah, go ahead, draw the comic strip. And then we never expected that uh, the student would do this. But that also brings up the concept that the root can break the stone very well. And then we can have a discussion on that. So that's how uh, the uh, the entire thing works. Many a times what happens is no matter what, how much ever you try, sometimes some things just don't work. 
Okay. And it might have worked very well last year, but it doesn't work this year. That is also possible. So we need to evaluate. And it's not like at the end of it, ki, oh, this did not work. So isko. Like just leave it. No. We will put it back again that, okay, did I go wrong in my need analysis? Was my outcome activity, what was it not enough flexible? So when we do all this, this particular thing is called as the model is called as the ADI model, the most famous model for all instruction design. There are many models for instruction design, but this is the one which is most commonly used simply because it is very relatable to our normal teaching learning process. And that is the reason why we use this ADI model. And uh, ADI model forms the building block of the entire instruction design if you are going to base it on these five ways or in these five steps. And so, yeah, you can find at least five more models, not an issue. And you can choose the others. But just uh, if this is more relatable and if this is easily understandable, then go ahead first with this. Try to have a plan and then maybe uh, the next models we can use. So once we start getting into the process, let's think about this as, okay, I'm going to create an e-content. Now, if it's going to be an e-content, the e-content could be a scrapbook, a digital scrapbook. The e-content could be my photographs that my students have taken into a flip book. And each flip book will be a different set of, you know, stages of germination of this particular thing. So it could be all of that. And it could be a role play. It could be a comic strip using a comic, um, comic making tool. It could also be a podcast. It, you know, you can ask the student if they can actually uh, have a podcast with, let us say, some farmers or some, like from, for the city like me, I can't even think of farmers. What we would think is the urban terrace gardeners and then their own experiences of how it can work. You know, uh, for this particular thing, um, I'll share this again. That when we did this germination thing, right, uh, we had lots of um, small legumes and lots of other things which were grown. And we actually, since we we come from a very space strived, uh, we, we strive very hard for the place. So we had them grow it in the food containers, the small food containers that you get, uh, like only chota chota dabba, right? So, and using not even the soil, but uh, the tissue paper, which was wetted. And so they could actually see it. Now, um, like people, everyone in the class or anyway, why do we do this? Where are we going to grow this? So that was a question that the students had asked. And uh, I will never ask, stop, ask any student to stop questioning. So they asked that, why do we do this? We are not going to do any farming or anything. So why do we need to even know this? So I said, no, microgreens, you know, then the nutritional value, then this and then that. And believe me, once uh, they started doing this, uh, during the parent-teachers meeting at the end of the month, the parents were saying that, no, they have learned a lot because now they insist that we will grow microgreens and we will use these microgreens, which are very high in nutrition, in the salads that we consume every week. So students are growing wheat grass, mustard microgreens. Now, all this is not there in the textbook. The textbook only talks about one germination. But let's see how this application has been done. And all this is actually documented in multiple forms. Now, if like, like I said, the photograph to the podcast, everything is there. So if we can do that, then also the we are satisfying the NEP requirements as well. And basically, we are doing learner centricity. Just give me a minute. There are some 15 uh, messages in the chat. Let's see. Okay, Gardner. Yeah, someone actually said that. Yes. All right. So again, how do we get into the process? So even if it is an online or an offline, the first thing that we need to set is what are the objectives and what are the outcomes? So what am I even going to want as an outcome? Do I want them to have a book written or I want to have them as a comic strip or do I want to have them as a podcast or a video? You know, uh, you can also ask them to take uh, 
फास्ट फॉरवर्ड वाला वीडियो यू नो दे कैन जस्ट डू दैट विथ दे मोबाइल इफ इट इज अलाउड इफ नॉट वी कैन ऑल्सो हैव सर्टन एक्टिविटीज लाइक प्रेडिक्ट ऑब्जर्व एक्सप्लेन वेर you will show them something that uh, this many days is required for this particular part then what will happen if you are changing the seed uh, okay and i don't come from bio side i'm originally a chemist uh, my masters is in organic chemistry so uh, even when we do this so while doing the ph now again a very interesting uh, thing if i guess we have that much time right yeah yeah so um, the interesting part is when we were doing ph experiment so i asked the students i gave i handed uh, students the ph paper and i told them that go home and find out the ph of five things that you have around you and it can be anything so the textbook talks about the soap so don't do, do about the soap if you want to do about the soap try different soaps so then they tried from bathing soap to shower gel to the washing utensil soap and everything there were a few there were a couple of kids who who came up with something different that was they tested the saliva and there were others of course who did who tested ph with tea coffee milk and noted down they tested their own saliva before lunch and after lunch i mean before a meal and after a meal and how the acidity of the mouth changes and there was one who also tested the saliva of his pet dog and they came up with that as well and then we have documented that and it's there on azim prem ji's website so uh, that's how it led to the discussion on what happens to the acidity within the mouth and then uh, that since that was the objective that they should understand uh how different ph affects different things so the outcome is actually to observe the ph of different substances at different intervals or same substance at different intervals so then it was conceptualized that way and then what happened was um uh, they could actually we, we did have a great discussion on cavities and why um uh, certain products like dento white Uh, or you know you have chewing gum which keeps your ph maintains your ph of the mouth same so all of that discussion going beyond the textbook and actually applying the terms and the concepts in daily life is what we did and of course very important please document the design uh why do we need to document is multiple reasons i will write i'll tell a couple but i'll wait for the others to right why do we need to document the design one is is to you know for our own record and that becomes our own research that what worked what did not work what needs to be worked so as a researcher as a researcher of pedagogy i need to document things because i can also then see that how the change of activities or how the interest of children change from time to time what are my technological aspects that keep on changing so that's one way uh, if anyone else has got any thoughts on why do we have to to look back at activities for our future references yes so anyone else to look back and for future reference both so for future reference of not only us but maybe the next teacher who comes in for the next year or maybe if you have a parallel teacher teaching the same thing in the other class you can have a very good yeah students are motivated yes and reflection of course so do document the design and whenever we have an activity let's try to develop and cultivate the sense of inquiry among students now when we say inquiry there is this misconception that that happens only for the stem subjects and not the others no no who said that because uh i really don't know whether this i can what i'm explaining just now can be understood in this particular group because i don't know what it is called grammatically so uh, there is a concept of grammar where we break the word into two words so it's called as sandhi so it's ma- it makes a big word in hindi in sanskrit and all that type of languages which is actually a combination of two words 
So just as an example, I'll give you if the build, if the name is Anand Ashram, it means Anand and Ashram. So it's like a place where there's a lot of joy. So this is a concept in Hindi grammar, Marathi grammar. So I can always say that, okay, the inquiry mind has to be like this, that look around you and try to find out ways or try to find out building names which have such combinations. So uh, that's how you develop an inquiry mind. Even for um, civics, even for history, uh, where are the heritage cultures? I mean, where are the heritage sites? And are there any heritage sites that are not there? Then whom will you complain if you have got pot potholes on your road? Civic sense. So again, we need to develop and cultivate the inquiry mind of asking what is the objective of doing this and what outcome is expected amongst the students as well. And that is why this is the whole cycle of instruction design that is constantly there. Uh, there are again seven more messages. Uh, blending, word formation process. Okay. okay. We call it as uh, collocation. We call it as sandhi in uh, Hindi and Sanskrit and Marathi. Yeah, so good. Give some good social science example. Like I already gave that, uh, you know, uh, our roads have lots of potholes and I'm talking this on the on record. So we had uh, asked students to actually find out that who do you actually complain to if your roads are not in good situation? Okay, do you complain to the chief minister? Or you complain to a Nagar Sevak. Or you complain to a municipal officer. Whom do you actually complain? And where is the office? You know, uh, that that actually came from one of the student uh, side. Because in grade 6, they have a chapter on UN. And personally speaking, for me also, I feel that that chapter is very heavy for that particular age. Because... It talks about role of UN and all that. And grade six is too young to understand that. But we need to go really local and understand that, okay, what can the students relate to? Also, there's another example for social sciences that comes to my mind about the activity that we had done. Uh, two of them and very interesting activities. And uh, one of my friends had conducted this. So what, we, what was done in that was one is... Uh, try to find out uh, because we were talking about uh, some some motifs in the temples and uh, that kind of thing in history it was there so we went to ask the students to find out the motifs used in the jewelry of that was used by their grandparents if they have a heritage piece if not a jewelry then uh, the design that is used in the fabric and then how is it related and how what is the cultural consequence of it? Mm. Also, there was a different type of an activity that my friend had conducted to, to just compare our birth certificates. Because every state has got a very different type of birth certificate. And, uh, you know, it comes under, uh, does it come under the union list or does it come under the state list or does it come under the concurrent list? Why is this difference there? So it's very difficult for a sixth standard student to understand what are these lists and who's actually who. For them, like the council is the same, the municipality is the same. It's just an officer, right? So if we go to a very local level, then it becomes more relatable. Okay, again, there are some messages. Let us just check. Okay. Huh. So, uh, did I answer your question? Uh, people who have answered. Now comes here. Okay, before we go, go to that. Now we are going to do the lesson planning part. And uh, as the session now begins, uh, I mean, this continuation, the next half an hour, we are actually going to pick up one particular thing from our own subject, from our own domain, from our own topic, and actually try to plan an instructional design. Now, like we said, that it is going to be backward design. So first, we need to understand that what is the outcome that I'm expecting. And once we talk of the outcome, 
let us go back to that ADI model where we were talking of the constraints. So if I'm expecting that my students are going to make a lovely exhibition, like someone said that no need of an exhibition. Yeah, maybe my constraints don't allow me to have an exhibition. Then what else? Okay, maybe digital. Okay, if not, maybe a scrapbook, which at least should be there. So can I have something like that? So first, what we do in instruction design is we don't do teaching learning activities before we decide the outcomes. So first thing first, we will first decide the outcome. Then we will decide the assessment. And once we are clear of the first two parts, only then we go to the teaching learning. So just take a minute to, you know, uh, understand this particular table. You want to take a screenshot, it's okay. But this particular table. So this is what we are going to do now in the next half an hour. And what we want you all to do is we want you all to come up with this for your subject, your your sub topics from your subject, your domain, for your class. And discuss and think about this. This is going to be a brainstorming uh, next half an hour is brainstorming so that you can actually develop the entire thing. So just take a moment and see if there are any doubts here. Now, if you have any doubts, you can ask. So we need to be very clear about the outcome. What do I want my students to be able to do? Do I want them to just rattle off the definition or rattle off some points? Do I just want that? Or I can think of something new, something better. Okay. Why assessment before leaving? Leaving what? I didn't understand your question. How much time will it take? How much time will it take? It's still 11.15. 11.15. You want to do the I'm coming from... Okay. Shall we write on paper or text here? Why assessment before learning? Yes. Okay. You can write on a piece of paper and submit. You can use a Word document and submit. I think Diksha will be able to tell you how the submission has to be done. She is a better person to tell. Otherwise, I would prefer you to use a Word doc and then submit. But I'll tell you why assessment before teaching learning. The simple reason why assessment before teaching learning is suppose if I am going to plan, like make a photo album, I will also need to teach them how to create a photo album. I cannot just give it to them just that way. Right? So my teaching learning activity should then also involve making of a teach of a photo album. So right now, how they ask that, is it going to be a written document or what? So suppose if I wanted that, no, you should do it in Excel just now, then I might have to give you the link as well. But because I know that it's it might not be possible for many of you, uh, there could be people who are not attending from the, mm, from the uh, laptop. So I'm giving you this. It depends upon how do you do it. But submission, yes, you will have to submit it once it is done. What happens if we, uh, again, this is a difference between the normal teaching learning and instruction design. What happens is we first teach and then we ask questions. Uh, I mean, not very, not very logical because there are so many things that we want the outcome of, right? Uh, ID or instruction design talks about every single topic and not the end of the topic. And also it is, we can classify it into in the class activity, out of the class activity. Once we know what type of assessment do we want to have. 
or what outcome do we need to have so this is called as backward design you don't teach 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 first and then frame the paper later by that time the uh, like many of the students do say this that question paper likke we forgot what we wrote we don't remember what we wrote that is because the outcome was only based on the memory or only based on the uh, content that was being taught but if you are talking about application we will have to first think about the assessment also i remember one of my uh, one of my friends saying this when we were in school that you know teacher gives teacher solves simple sums in the class and gives difficult sums as homework because they are towards the end of this exercise and then the period gets over and so it goes for homework so if we know that no this is the outcome that they should be able to solve this particular level of sums then my assessment would also have that 30 30 30 type of a thing and then my teaching learning will change that no i will solve five very difficult sums i will take the assignment in the class and let them read or go through the videos at home instead of me teaching them as if they don't know anything that time has gone off so it's better if we have lots of assignments and hands on activities in the class okay so we have like lots of messages here no it's not a pre test it is actually we we are not taking the test we are designing the test this is the plan so like i said suppose uh, okay let's take one example mm, can we take one example let us say mm, okay we'll go back to the ph wala example where we are taking the ph paper and uh, counting the ph what is there or we can also take that example that uh, there are lots of potholes on the road now what do you do okay so i want my students to know what are the civic bodies and who is taking care of what so normally it is like you know how it's given in the textbook is this is the civic body this is the municipality this is the role of the this officer that officer blah 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 students learn wrote learn write forget okay now what i would do is my assessment is whether they should be able to identify where they are going to send this particular complaint now i can ask i can have this outcome in multiple ways i can ask a fill in the blank type of a thing yeah. boring for the students i can ask complete the analogy doesn't fit i can ask them to write a letter actual write a letter went out whatever they want to say now is this letter going to be handwritten will we actually take it to the nagar sevak or the municipal officer yeah we can we can say that this is what the students have written see so your students are having so much of civic responsibility so if it is that then i would ask them to write it on a sticky note kind of a paper a very short thing and it could be like then a collage of all the notes that you have done with the photograph of the location if not photograph at least the location where it is what is the dimension of the pothole on the road what is the condition of the road since when it is there all that and then put it up and then actually take it to the concerned municipal officer ask the head boy or the head girl to lead the delegation that's how uh, they become good citizens right so my assessment is going to decide what and how i teach my teaching learning activities planned that's why okay there are lots of messages let me just check here types of quadrilaterals give them different shapes identify differences okay why do you why to give different shapes can we not ask them to look around and figure out where the quadrilaterals are right from the window sill to the shape of the window to the shape of the room to the shape of their lunch box to the pen stand and god knows what all so let's try to learn mm, things without without the textbook textbook kind of thing um our students to identify types of leaves yes absolutely and connection between type of leaves shape size of tree yes so now once you have said that ask them to do this now comes the factor how will they do it 
will they draw or will they note down or you are going to give them the pictures or they are going to observe around or what. So this is where the assessment framing comes first and on the basis of that, the teaching learning activity will come. Like for example, if you are taking that leaves ka part, uh, do I ask this, uh, how many, uh, how much of identification do I need my students to come up with? Five, six, seven, okay, seven of them. Which one? The ones that are around. Around means at home, at school, on the road to home, or even from some encyclopedia. So just see how my assessment uh, thing is working up. So if that is there, then how do I actually plan my teaching learning activities? I will plan it in a way where it could be, uh, I would give them something or I would first ask them to come up with their observations and then give five more. Come up with two each, see what students are coming up with and whatever is missing, I will give that in the class. So now my teaching learning is planned in a way so that my objective or my outcome that I have designed for my assessment that students should have identification of seven types of plants for different leaves. It's satisfied. If they are going to come up with the same two or three types, my duty right, to supplement it with three, four, five more. If I keep on giving... And then ask them to like find out. It's very difficult. Believe me. If I tell you just now. Think of any topic. You will take one hour just to think of the topic. But if I tell you. Okay. Grade 6 or grade 7. Your topic. That you are teaching just now. Before you started attending the SRG. Or the topic that you are going to teach. After this SRG program is going to get over. Suddenly your choices get narrowed down. And the assessment comes out quicker and faster. So that's why assessment always first. Because what if I tell them that, okay, you will be drawing certain things. But there could be lots of students in my class who hate drawing. But who are very good at photography. Then, so my need analysis, my assessment needs to have that many multiple things. Okay, nine messages again. Let me just check. Yeah, yeah, inductive method, yeah. Did someone, oh my God, there is a, there is a handwritten note, but I'm very sorry, I can't read that. It's too small and, you know, like, because I'm in the studio, it there are lights here, so I actually can't read. I did a population survey and census, which is a residential school, sent student delegates to different hostels, staff quarters. Students submit their report on the demography of the campus. Lovely. Nice. So this could be a very good exercise to teach them how census works and what, uh, what is the whole concept of census. Okay, so why is this demographic activity taken? Why is the demographic data needed? So that facilities can be given. So the whole purpose of census can come out from that. So my teaching learning activity is based on what assessment I want to take or what is the learning outcome that I have in my mind. A very active group, this one. Like by the time I answer a question, there are eight or nine uh, comments there. That's a very nice group. Mobile. To understand various nutritious food assessment is role play. Yeah, that's uh, anything else. Can anyone else think about anything other than role play for nutritious food? Come on, let's have this as a discussion. What type of assessments can we have? So the learning outcome is to know about nutritious food. Okay. So what would be the assessment? Can you think about it? No. We are now talking about the nutrition wala thing. Simply because it's easy to answer. It's not domain specific. 
name of the topic nutrition to make them understand importance of balanced diet impact assessment is formative mein hai identifying um, identifying what nutrient rich foods from the given pictures of the worksheet then pen and paper test ah this is very traditional ah madhuri ma'am okay anyone can think about something else for this nutrition wala thing seven messages eight my god this is like local talk with grandparents uh, comic strips on nutrition value uh, match the words picture model start with what is rich in what okay i'm still waiting for something interesting all this is very commonly done this we used to do when we were students right our teachers used to do this come on we need to think something jatak patak ekdam something very trendy what makes your meal a balanced one okay nutritional week celebration meal planning ha huh? this is something nice i liked the one that is meal planning nutrient analysis correct so what we can do is we can ask the students to have a nutrition analysis of their lunch box every day for let us say 10 days and then come and think of it and then someone had said that ask about uh, nutrition of the grandparents or talk to grandparents yes very crucial because like honestly speaking uh grandparents are much healthier than what we are today right so my uh, my grandmother will wash her own clothes even today and i won't be able to wring the clothes that's that's the unfortunate but yeah we uh, we have not paid that much attention to the nutrition so our grandparents are fitter and having more nutritious diet then what so can we ask them to because this generation talks a very different language as compared to what you and i used to talk at students i'll just give you an example i mean uh, my phd topic was uh, using facebook for education so i can say that there are lots of advertisements on the social media that compare okay what about corn flakes plus milk versus poha plus chai what is more nutritious what is the nutritional analysis what are you actually putting in should you start with sugar or should you not start with sugar let them collect then let them analyze let them see what's there in their own part in their own lunch box do nutritional analysis role plays yeah it is good but better than that this analysis then someone said about the table or the poster yes try to have a try to make a um, balanced meal you know design a balanced thali also for the remote places as well as to know what is happening in the local surroundings uh as per the nep that says also that we we have to give the local word so what are the nutrition rich uh, foods in your area so uh, the millets so the area from where i come from is very famous for the millets we have like lots of millets so wheat is actually the last thing that used to be used earlier uh, we would use jowar bajra and ragi and so many like we have around say 8 to 10 millets what are the ones that are present in your side what type of oil do we use what type of ghee do we use what type of spices do we use it all is geographical it all is nutritional and then you have people to either make an analysis make a graph how well did you eat and that's how you design an app you just tell them that this is this is nothing but what your app does for you you are doing it manually so that's how you can do it oh my god 45 messages let me just check uh 
We ask students to make vegetable salads and pickles, millets, encourage sharing personal experiences. Yes. Analysis of traditional meal combinations. Lovely answer that one is. Like lovely thought that is. Many nutritionists are also talking about that. What is a traditional meal analysis? So can we have that versus... There, there could also be one thing. This is just coming on the thought. I mean, on the go. Uh, we can ask them to analyze what they have in the packet foods. Really, what is the nutrition? Uh, if you try to see the juice packets, okay? Now, this can be a very nice combination for science and economics, both. Uh, if you see the fruit juice packets that are there, I'm not going to name any company, but the highest amount of fruit in a one liter fruit juice packet, the highest is 36 grams or 36%. All the rest is sugar. And we know that sugar is not good. So when you think that, oh, I'm taking, you know, this is very natural. It is made from natural fruit. How is that even possible? I, I asked my students because I come from the area where mangoes, right? Alfonso. So I asked them that we have Alfonso hardly for three months. Okay, mangoes throughout the year you don't get. You get hardly for three months. That also we all know that how difficult it is to sustain the mangoes. And you think all the companies producing the mango drink produce like thousands of bottles every day. From where are they getting the mangoes if all that they claim is really made up of mangoes? What happens to that export? And how is it even possible? Like, you know, there is a product which claims that they are using almond powder. And the thing is like 120 rupees for 100 grams. I just ask the students, can you actually do the financial calculation, please? Like try to find out what is the rate of almonds. The kacha almonds that you get, that you, are, you need to process. So just see, it just doesn't fit. Financially, it doesn't fit so that you can't have that, right? So that type of things we can always have again. Uh, prepare posters, ask them to bring favorite food to school. Yes, new food packages. Yeah. So all of that we can do. And that's what we are going to do. So we can use it, the, the, the template that I showed, right? You can use it for hybrid class. You can use it for flipped class. You can ask half of the things to be done out of class, then continue with in-class activity. You can, uh, hybrid is like if uh, you want to like have half of the students in the online mode, half of the students in the offline mode. And then you can have it in blend, do some certain activities at home or do certain activities in school and then follow it up at home and then some at home first and then follow it up in the school. So uh, all this you can do, but that's what we are going to do now. So uh, yeah, thank you for saying that it's, uh, oh yeah, desi vegetables and fruits versus important. Yeah, uh, because you said this, right? You can also bring in the carbon footprint wala thing that, if you're going to consume local fruits, local vegetables, then you reduce your carbon footprint and you are actually benefiting the earth rather than eating what you call as imported. We actually don't have any imported ones now. They all are grown here only. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay, so that's with one particular blended and hybrid. How do they differ? Okay, so... Uh, okay, hybrid is where one set of students will be always only offline. They will never go online. And some of the learners will always be online. They will never come offline. So that is hybrid. Okay, where like suppose if I am doing this with you just now. And I'm going to repeat the same type. I am not. That's a different session. But I'm just telling you. If I am going to repeat the same thing here in person. Your group and this group is never going to meet. My activities for you and my activities for them are not going to be 
exactly same because my constraints change, right? So what I am conducting with you, I will not be conducting with them, but I will need to design activities in such a way that it will be suitable for you also and for them also. So completely online, completely offline. They don't interchange. They don't swap the position. But in blended and flipped, flipped is a part of blended. In blended, you are online some part of the time of the instruction and you're offline in some part of the instruction. Flipped me, you first are online, all of them are online and then you become offline and do things in the offline way. That's the most simplest way in which uh, I could explain. I hope I answered your question, but answer. Okay. Uh, flip learning is where I give my uh, content first. So if I record this entire thing of a few examples that I have spoken and I tell them that now I tell you all that these are the examples. This is my recording. Watch it. This is the notes. Read it. Come. We will be doing the assignment now. So today's session, that Adi Wala part was there, right? So I could have recorded it and I could have told you to watch the video and come. Now, before we go ahead, if you're going to, if you're planning it that way, just saying that watch the video and come, no one is going to watch and come. Okay. It's like, yeah. Okay, we will watch. Why? Because you are going to explain it. So two things. Before you come to the class, I will have to ask certain questions that will tell me whether you have really watched the video or not. And that time and the class time should be again having a gap because the moment I say that, okay, come to the class after watching the video and I gave you the video two days ago. I asked you the question today morning before the class or in the class. I don't have time for you to go back and watch. But if I give you the video three, four days prior, after two days, I give you, let us say, an activity that will tell me who has actually watched or who has not watched. I'll not ask you MCQs. I'll just give you an activity based on that video. First, to complete the activity, you will have to see the video. Okay. I need to design the activity like that. Or if it is an MCQ and I come to know that, okay, person XYZ has not answered correctly, I will message or he gets the feedback that your answers are wrong and you need to watch the video again. Get 80% in the test so that attend the class. So that's my flip class. So I'm giving enough time for my participants to go back to the material and see and read and come to the class. So that's how we actually, ideally we should plan. Because see, asking in the class, did you watch the video? Yes. Tell me. I don't know. So then what is the other option for left for the teacher? If you don't know, I will have to explain only. What message does it send? That okay, even if I don't watch, teacher is going to explain. So forget, I will not watch. So flip lessons need to be planned in a proper way where there is enough gap kept so that if the student is not watching the video, not reading, then we should point it out that, okay, this is wrong. And then only come to the class. Okay. So I can see a few people who have now switched on their videos. So is it because you want to ask something? Uh, Kumkum Devnaji, your video is on. I mean, I can see your video on now. If you had kept it on earlier, I was not able to see. Uh, blended flipped hybrid which of these gives best learning outcomes for students all three depends on how you use it depends on your constraints so blended ideally is yes, because the students are very used to uh, seeing watching things so blended flipped very well hybrid also very well but that needs to have like two sets so it would be like I'm live streaming from here and here are the others who are actually watching what I am doing they are doing a different activity. You are doing a different activity. And I have to keep an eye on them. I have to keep an eye on your activity. So hybrid is what I would say a little bit more load on the instructor. And also the constraints because I need a camera, uh, a camera which will live stream. But as blended, I can actually record and I can give, I can flip it. I can do lots of things. 
Okay. Yes, flip learning is useful simply, but if you do it in a proper way, that's like how we discussed, right? Like you need to have that much time. So once that time is there, then fine. Okay. Questions? So when we come to the end of this, ideally, because we'll be throwing this open for discussion now. So design is not just, oh, it's a well-designed chair. No, it works well because it doesn't give you backache. So a good chair, a well-designed chair works better. So, it may be looking very simple, but it looks good because it works good. Okay. So, anything else? Diksha, uh, can we then... I don't know. Diksha, are you there? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, it's almost 11 and the session was till 11.15. So should we give them like 15 minutes time for them to work and submit? How has the CIT planned to oh, take yes, their... You can give them time to uh, uh, submit their uh, assignment. Okay. So then I guess we can wrap up this session. Let them... Uh, like if they have taken the screenshot, uh, if they can frame the entire part of the instruction design yes, and then they can they can submit it in the SRG group like whatever LMS you people have decided uh, yes so, all the participants can submit their assignment in the SRG group and if there are any queries ma'am can answer the queries yes. yeah can we compare design with project work no project can fail design should not fail all design is a project but uh, you can always say that uh, it's a bad design. So if it's a bad design, then why did you even design it, right? So I'll just give you an example. You you get those copper copper car water bottles, and they make so much of noise because the screw gets coated often with oxides, and then it's not easy to fit them in. And so every time you close it, and every time you open it. It is like making noise. It, it's just not a good product. It's not a good product. It's also a bad design. Okay, please mention the assignment again. Uh, there was a table given. I'll uh, give the table again if you want. But of course, I mean, the slides are already shared with the CIT. So they will be uh, sharing it. So in that table, you had the learning outcomes, assessment and the teaching learning activities, right? So... Choose a topic from your domain, your subject, and create one plan like that for one short subtopic and submit. I hope that's clear. It's just for one subtopic. But the beauty of this is you are going to design the assessments first and the teaching learning activities to the end. Uh, format, please, again. Okay. You can take the screenshot. Take a topic of your subject or a very small subtopic, design a learning outcome, then design the assessment, what you want from that particular topic as an outcome. How will they improve? How will the students submit? Just have be like how everyone asked, how do we have to submit? Yeah, then there is an LMS and then Diksha said that no, submit it in the group. So that's no, how. Very good. So assessment and then the teaching learning. That's how you will be submitting. I hope that's clear. Okay. So if it's clear, then uh, let's stop the session, Diksha, and let's give them time. Oh, yes. So thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful uh, interactive session. 
Uh, it was a great session and we all got to learn a lot. And I'm sure all the participants will incorporate these methods into their teaching and learning as well. So thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, uh, thank you.